Okay, well, welcome to Jera Street at 6.30, everyone. If this is your first time, then uh, this is our evening gathering for students and adults. It's good to see you all. Uh, well, last week, Graham introduced the character of Gideon to us. Gideon, who we found hiding in a wine press from his enemies and nervous and reluctant, but God called him anyway. In fact, God called him a mighty warrior and promised to save uh, the land of Israel from the army of Midianites that surrounded them through Gideon's hand. That's where we left it in our series in the life of Gideon so far. And I, I wonder what you might think your enemies are that you face this week. Um, maybe there are people that annoy you or upset you. Hopefully you wouldn't describe any brother or sister in Christ in that way. But maybe your thoughts go somewhere else. The three greatest enemies of the church in the New Testament are often described as the world, the flesh and the devil. Um, and this week, for instance, how will our enemy, the devil, tempt you to give in to uh, selfish desires or passions to sin against God? Well, very soon we're going to be reading the next part of um, the book of Judges together. And we'll see what implications there are of Gideon's battle with the Midianites for our own battle against our sin and temptations in our own lives. But I'm going to hand over to uh, Kerry, first of all. And I, I think Kerry has got a song or two lined up for us. Uh, Kerry's going to lead us in, a, in our first song just now. Over to you, Kerry. I didn't know how to unmute myself. I'm going to move it so my face is not huge on my screen. Um, first one is Jesus, lover of my soul, just popped towards into the chat. Thank you. 
Sorry, Kerry, you're very, you're very quiet there. I can't hear you. Do you want to pray for us, Kerry? time that we have tonight for this time to worship together and to hear your word together and um, lord god i pray that you would bless us and um, as we meet together as brothers and sisters lord god i pray that we would be challenged tonight and i pray that we'd be encouraged as well lord god thank you for tim's preparation i pray that you would be glorified tonight amen amen well thank you so much uh carrie that was a particularly apt song choice as well uh, well, let's take a look at our passage tonight, shall we? And we'll see what we can learn of the story of Gideon as we fight our own battles in our own lives. So to start with, uh, we're just going to jump straight. And we're going to read the last verses of chapter six together of Judges from verse 36. And we'll take a pause. OK, this is uh, Judges chapter six, verse 36. I think everyone can hear me OK before we get going. Great. OK, here we go. Then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so when he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung out enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night and it was dry on the fleece only and on all the ground there was dew. As I said, let's pause here for a moment before we go on to read the rest of it. It's very tempting, isn't it, when we read the Old Testament and especially something like this to jump straight to asking the question, what is this passage telling me? And that I must do right now. And that question might show a desire to learn from God through his word. But before we ask what a passage is saying to us, especially one that's written like this in a totally different part of God's salvation plan, we have to ask what the passage is saying to its original readers. That's a really important question to bear in mind when reading your Bible. So what is going on here in Judges 6? We well, might have heard some people talk about this idea of laying out a fleece to determine say um something like which of two job offers to take or whether they should marry this man who's asked them or whatever um they put out some kind of physical test maybe a fleece maybe not and ask god to show them his will for their life to guide them now i would say i i don't think we're being told to copy gideon here and even he says please don't let your anger burn against me god so he knows he's not setting a good example i think uh, and that's because he already knows what he's supposed to be doing and in faith he should just be getting on with it He's, he's not in the position, really, of needing guidance. And with regards to guidance, let me encourage you as a kind of a, a side point this evening that you don't need a, a soggy fleece on the ground uh, anyway to help you make a decision like the examples I gave. Um, rather than a dew soaked fleece, let's become scripture soaked people. Get your nose in your Bible, get soaked in God's principles so that you can be wise and mature to make good and godly decisions. Uh, this is what Kevin DeYoung says. He says, you don't need dreams, visions, fleeces, impressions, open doors, random Bible verses, casting lots, liver shivers or writing in the sky. Just do something. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit at work in us, growing us into maturity and wisdom. But anyway, get, getting back to this, this passage in particular, I don't think guidance is what this is about. Look at what Gideon actually says. Second part of verse 37. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. So what Gideon wants is not guidance on what he should do. Gideon wants reassurance that God is able and trustworthy. Reassurance that God can and will do what he has already said. Uh, Graham mentioned last time Baal was the god of harvests, of fertile kind of damp ground. So maybe that's what the fleece is about. God, prove you're bigger than Baal in this kind of area of the of ground, you know, sovereign over this other God. And that's not said explicitly, so we don't know. Maybe it's a little bit like um, also called but reluctant Moses and his snake staff. You remember that um, the, his, his staff ate up the snakes of Egypt. God was bigger than Egypt's God. But anyway, what we have in this paragraph is a leader 
who has been called by God to a task and yet is tentative and lacking in faith. And we have a God who is gracious to reveal himself, to reassure his chosen one yet again. Uh, and those themes are going to be important. We're going to lay those down there and pick them up in a bit. But let's read the rest of our passage. Uh, we're going to just read the whole of chapter seven in one go now. Uh, so this is Judges chapter seven, verse one. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped before, uh, beside the spring of Harod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any one of whom I say this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. And let all the others go every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets. And he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night, the Lord said to him, Gideon, arise, go down against the camp for I've given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterwards, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servants, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance and their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade and he said, behold, I dreamed a dream and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade uh, answered, this is no other than the sword of Gideon the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped and he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just set the watch and they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade, comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Bethshaita towards Zerah, as far as the border of Abel Mahola by Tabath. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from Almanasa, and they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them for as, as far as Beth Bara and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they captured the waters as far as Beth Bara and also the Jordan. And they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. Then they pursued Midian and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. That's God's word. Thanks to him. So.
So could God save his people? Would God save his people? Well, the answer is a resounding yes, isn't it? Gideon and his army are utterly triumphant. They pursue their fleeing enemies through the land. They capture the leaders of their enemies and behead them. Uh, Israel are saved. God has won the day. But what's really unique and notable about the victory is the manner in which it's won. Did you, did you manage to follow what happened? So Gideon assembled together 32,000 Israelites for the fight, which is, which is good because he's going to need them. Because the Midianites, verse 12, are like locusts in abundance, it says, as sand is on the shore. In other words, there are an absolute low ton of them. But what does God say? Verse two, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Too many. Your army's too big, says God. Um, you know, your, your arms are too strong to pick up that rock. You're too brainy to pass that exam. You're too fast to win that race. Those statements don't make any sense, do they, in, in human terms? And yet, what is God's concern? There are so enough Israelites, he says, that when they win, they might think it was about them. They might boast. But God wants to be clear in this battle that it is all about him. It is all about his salvation and his victory. And he is not going to go sharing the glory with anyone else. So God gives Gideon two ways to reduce his troop numbers. Uh, the first one is that anyone who is afraid should go home, which costs Gideon immediately 22,000 men, more than two thirds of his army. And maybe that may, might make some sense to him. You know, fear can spread quickly in an army. Maybe it's better not to have those guys. Although equally, you might think maybe just a good pep talk would have been more sensible. Anyway, the, the scared ones go home. But then God says there are still too many. And, uh, and, and this time God has Gideon make them all take a drink. And depending on their style of drinking, they get sent home. And at this point, we are very clearly now in the territory of decision making that makes no sense to a, to a poor old human general like Gideon. But Gideon knows what he's told anyway, and now he's left with just 300 men. Last time Gideon, uh, last time Graham said he was proud to have mentioned the movie 300 in the last two weeks running. Well, I'm just going to leave that one there, though, and he can decide whether or not that counts as a hat trick. Uh, 300 men, though, are all Gideon has left, which is less than 1% of what he started with. 300 men to fight an army like a locust swarm. A tiny remnant of the army to win the day for all Israel. But in the end, it's all God anyway, isn't it? Because if you notice, not even the remnant of this army do any actual fighting. They just have to be faithful and follow some instructions. Gideon turns out to be the mighty general God has called him to be. He comes up with a plan that's pretty clever, actually. So the Midian, uh, Midianite army is asleep. Uh, it's nighttime and there are different shifts of guards on watch. And what Gideon does is he picks the exact moment when there's a change of guard to have his three soldiers uh, blow their trumpets, smash their jars, make an absolute din. And the asleep Midianites wake up. They rush out of their tents in panic, thinking they're under attack. And in the dark, they can just make out some soldiers coming towards them. In reality, it's their own tired watchmen coming back in from their shift. But in the confusion, they, they fight each other and, and they're all bewildered and they panic and they all run away. Now, the remnant of Israel's army needed only to be faithful to Gideon's plan and to God's word. And God won the battle through them. So what is the story saying to us? This story is pointing us time and time again to the fact that only God was really going to win this battle. Only God would save his people. All the glory is his. The general he chose, the remnant of the army that he picked, they were just the tools he used. Now, I said at the beginning, this is an Old Testament, Old Covenant story. Our battles are not against flesh and blood, says Ephesians 6 in the New Testament. We do not fight against Midianite armies with trumpets and torches and swords. Our enemies are spiritual. We battle against the devil. We struggle with our sin and against temptation. We stare down death who has us locked in its inevitable gaze. And so, brothers and sisters, that also means that this story isn't put there to say um, you must lay down a fleece like Gideon or faithfully go do this or that and be like the army remnant or only drink your water in a weird way from now on. That these things aren't the point of the story. The question is, where are we in this story? Who represents us here? Without getting kind of silly or going overboard in allegorization, 
uh, who, who, who is us here? Well, we're not the faithful remnant of Israel that God uses to win the victory, are we? For the only remnant of Israel truly and ultimately faithful to God's word in the Bible is not even 300 men, but just one man. Galatians tells us that he alone, singular, is the true descendant of Abraham. And in Matthew's gospel, he follows the whole pattern of Israel through the whole Old Testament. He's born of Abraham. He's called God's son. He's called out of Egypt. He's baptized through the river and into the wilderness where he's tempted to grumble against God. He goes up on the mountain and comes down again and he is exiled on the cross and then brought back at the resurrection. And through it all, far unlike God's people through the Old Testament story, 1 Peter 2 tells us that he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Jesus Christ fulfills the whole narrative of Israel and every promise given to them finds its yes and amen in him. Jesus is the faithful remnant that God ultimately uses to save his people. We are not that remnant. And neither are we given in this story. We are not the given champion of Israel. We are not the appointed judge. But again, we have one who is. Acts 17 says that God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Christ is also the new and better Gideon provided for us. Gideon is continually tentative. He's persistently weak in faith. He needs constant encouragement. Even after meeting the Lord personally last time, he has to ask twice for more miraculous signs to give him confidence in God. And verse 11, God gives Gideon one more thing to strengthen him before battle. The, the, the strange dream about the bread and the upcoming victory because he knows that Gideon is still afraid. But Christ is a hero who was ever faithful, never wavering in faith, despite any temptation thrown his way to doubt God's good purposes. We are not the hero. And finally, in, in case we're in any doubt, we are not the powerful saving one in this story either. We are not the victorious one who gets all the glory. We are not God. But again, Christ is. He has won the battle for us. He has brought us victory against our enemies. On the cross, he paid for sin totally. We are forgiven through him and at the resurrection, he conquered death for us. And so now we will live forever in him. This is 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Philippians 2 now, God has ex highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Not the faithful remnant army, not the appointed warrior judge, not the one who wins the day. So who are we in this story? Well, friends, we are the vast majority of Israel who don't fight. Maybe those even too scared to fight who were sent home at the beginning. For where were we? when God's great victory of our enemies was won. We were back home in Israel with our feet up, eating dinner with our wives and children, armor resting on the sideboard unused, just waiting to hear the news of what God and his faithful remnant had done on our behalf. That's the gospel, isn't it? God wins the victory for us through Christ without us lifting a finger. He doesn't need us and he certainly won't share his glory with us. Ephesians 2, it's all by grace so that no man may boast. And today we get to walk in his victory. Uh, did you notice where do the rest of Israel come back into our story after being sent home? Well, verse 23, the battle has won. The enemy has turned tail and fled and the message is sent throughout Israel to come and give chase. We'll finish it off. What part do we play in Christ's great victory over sin and the devil? Well, on the one hand, no part at all. But we do join in at the end. The battle is already won by him. But the Christian life today looks like hearing his call and running behind our champion with the great certainty and with the great authority of knowing the victory is already won for us. I wonder if, if you feel weary from the fight against sin just now. Maybe you feel disheartened. Or like you will never overcome some 
sin or temptation in your life. Or on the other hand, maybe you feel proud or puffed up just now because you feel like you're living a godly life. Or regardless, hear this. This is so important for fighting sin. If you think that the battle is yours and dependent on your willpower and your strength to win against your enemy, then you will fall. Now, the battle is Christ's and he has already broken the power of sin and death. So next time you feel temptation knocking on your door, the devil prowling by, whispering lies in your ear, then then close your eyes and remember Christ bursting from that tomb, standing with his foot on the devil's throat, torch in one hand, trumpet in the other hand, and beckoning you to stand by his side. Because that's where we are in, in this battle, guys, even when it doesn't feel like it. The devil loves to lie to you and say, you can't change, you can't do it, you're stuck. There's no way you can win. You can't do anything about your sin. But Christ has won on our behalf. And because of that, <laughs> we're able to tell the devil where to get off. It's such great news for the fight. Listen, life is, is complicated and even fighting a victory still feels like tough going and has ups and downs, doesn't it? Um, and so if you have questions about any of this or if you want to talk about an ongoing sin or temptation or lie of the devil that you just keep listening to, then then feel free to message me or call me or email me anytime. Or you can chat to one of your group leaders as well. But let's remember tonight that Christ has won the great victory for us. And so let's trust him and look to him. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you so much for, for Christ. Thank you for our great champion, our great hero, the faithful remnant of Israel. We, we thank you so much for him, for all that he has done. Thank you for his victory over the devil. Thank you for his, um, his victory over sin, his victory over death. And thank you that in him we can, we can, uh, we can run after him in his, in his wider army, following in the victory that he has already won for us. And Father, particularly for those tonight who feel trapped in some sin or temptation, they just can't feel like they can shake off. Father, I pray that that by your spirit, you would um, you would cement these truths into their hearts, that all of us together might walk in this victory, knowing that that you have done it all. Thank you so much. And, and we, we pray that as we sometimes attempted to feel puffed up or uh, like like it's about us or like we have done it father may we not may that not be so remind us father we are weak we are but um we are we are there's no way we can win this fight on our own but remind us we are weak and and uh remind our hearts that you are strong and you win you win the fight and all the glory is yours we praise you lord amen OK, well, uh, I'm going to hand back to Kerry just now and Kerry's going to lead us into another song before we head off into our groups. Thanks, Kerry. Yeah. Just pop the words in the chat and um, it's come there found. Um, I have different words next to my chords and I have the lyrics next to them. So if I sing the wrong words, I probably haven't noticed and you should just keep going. <laughs> Thank you. 
Lord to place thou great a debtor. Daily I am constrained to thee. Bless thy goodness like a better. Find my wandering heart to thee. Born to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Born to Thank you so much, Kerry. Um, well, we are going to go into our groups again now. Um, so a chance to chat through what we've just uh, heard in a bit more detail and to kind of catch up with each other and fellowship with each other and pray together as well. So uh, it is it is uh, just gone 10 past seven. So we will we'll, uh, we'll meet back together a, a couple of minutes before eight o'clock. Uh, let, me, let me open these groups again now and we will go from there. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you all again at the end, and I hope it's been a, a good time for you in your in your various groups. Um, and that's it, really, for the end of this evening. But uh, God bless you all, and I hope you have a wonderful week. And we'll be gathering again next week when um, Matthew Henderson will be joining us to speak on the next bit of. Uh, judges. So see you all then. You can wave again now. <laughs>